everyone. Thank you for joining us on Head & Neck Live. My name is Jamie Koo, and I'm very excited to introduce you guys our speaker this morning, Dr. Jason Chan, who is joining us all the way from Hong Kong. I think it's about 7 p.m. over there right now, so we appreciate his time. Um, so Dr. Chan is an prof uh, associate professor in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology uh, and head of neck surgery at the Department of, uh, I'm sorry, at the Chinese University in Hong Kong. Uh, he has a special research interest in the application of robotics and minimally invasive surgery in head and neck. Um, he is currently the deputy director of Jockey Club for Minimally Invasive Surgical Skills Center at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and also the Director of Undergraduate Teaching. So after completing his medical school training at the Guys, Kings, and St. Thomas Medical School in London, he completed his residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Johns Hopkins program, where I got to know him very well. So Dr. Jason Chan's legacy in residency is in a clinical and surgical excellence, but also while being very humble and kind, which is very hard to do. And so today his title is um, of his talk is preclinical and clinical development of robotics and otolaryngology head and neck surgery. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Chan. Thank you. Thank you, um, Jamie, for the um, kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Dr. Byrne, also for having me um, speak here as well. I'm just going to put up my slides. Uh, let's see. Oh, gee, let's go back. So um, I've titled my talk today, Preclinical and Clinical Development of Robotics for Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. And um, I'm going to talk more about what I've kind of worked on since I've come back to Hong Kong, which was back in 2014 when I started in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I do have some disclosures, um, recently co-founded a company uh, with um, some engineers uh, called Agilis Robotics. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a consultant for intuitive surgical, particularly around working around single port, the Da Vinci system and advisor for Aptorum, which is a biotech company that doesn't really bear much uh, in terms of this talk. So the objectives, um, I was gonna discuss some of the development of preclinical robotics uh, as applied to our specialty here. Um, what we've been doing in Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, and some of the experiences of uh, transitioning from preclinical to clinical uh, robotic use uh, in uh, otolaryngology, head and surgery, partly working with uh, some uh, recent uh, clinical robots and some that we've tried uh, moving from actually the lab uh, to real life patient use, um, and explore some of uh, the potential future directions uh, in robotic uh, applications for OHNS. Um, and to start with some of the research realm endeavors uh, that I've uh, taken a part of uh, within the last six years. Uh, and some of what we're trying to achieve um, is, uh, with, in terms of robotics, is full automation, uh, which you can see here right at the end, level five in terms of robotics use. Um, level zero is no enough autonomy. For example, us just operating with our hands, with the tool devices that we use. Um, and if we talk about moving to using the current robotic systems, Medrobotics, be it our intuitive and da Vinci robotic system, uh, we're mainly doing robotic assistance where the robot provides certain assistance uh, during our surgical procedures. Uh, task autonomy, where a robot can autonomously uh, do a certain task, for example, not tying or suturing, um, while the operator maintains control of the system, we still not even achieve uh, this goal at this point in time. So. I think uh, working currently uh, is towards task autonomy uh, with the goal of full automation, which is something that I don't think I will see uh, for the rest. Uh, let's see, um, see uh, during my career uh, at this point in time. Um, and a lot of this work involves not just clinicians, uh, but engineers, um, and it revolves around trying to solve a clinical problem. Um, and obviously, uh, you need funding to support uh, this work, be it from uh, public governmental funding uh, or from private funding, or if you're starting a company, uh, investors uh, such as venture capitalists. So um, my take on, on some of this work uh, is image guidance is important uh, in terms of moving forwards with 
moving towards task autonomy. And some of the more recent work um, we've done is trying to uh, do image guided work. Um, this is some work actually I did with Chris Holzinger, Stanley Leo at uh, Stanford and Raymond Zung in uh, University of Hong Kong, uh, with Jonathan Soldier um, and Madi at Intuitive. And um, what we've done here is essentially taken a cadaver uh, and we've cut down the carotid injected dye uh, into the carotid artery system. And then we've scanned this uh, cadaver in a CT suite and segmented. So we've selected what particular anatomy uh, we want to uh, see on a 3D image. Uh, we've also implanted fake tumors that you see on this uh, 3D uh, uh, cadaver segmented uh, cadaver here uh, in orange uh, that you rotate around here. So we've segmented out, uh, excuse me, the um, carotid artery system uh, here, um, uh, the internal uh, carotid artery part of the external, and the orange would be tumors. Um, and during uh, this, we've used this with the DaVinci SP here, uh, and we've uh, basically been able to uh, put this image through TilePro onto the surgeon's console. And you can rotate this image uh, easily on an iPad on the side to kind of match what you're looking at intraoperatively. Um, and you can see this green part here, this tumor is, is lateral to this vessel here, which matches up very nicely. Uh, with the CT scan image. So it can be used potentially intraoperatively as some sort of guidance. Uh, it can potentially be used as a tool for uh, patients' education as well. Um, but what we did next is we actually use, this is the DaVinci X system. So this is a rigid system, not a flexible system. Um, and here we have outlined the internal carotid artery um, based on that 3D model we created. Um, let's see. Um, and uh, based on that 3D model, uh, we've basically rigidly fixated the teeth, uh, the upper dentition to the maxilla of that 3D model, uh, so that this is kind of a, a registration of the image to the actual cadaver itself. Um, and you'll see what we hear with we're dissecting on the left-hand side. Um, here's the registration. It's fairly fixed, registered to the maxilla as we move the camera in and out. And next, we're going to try and dissect the internal carotid artery <coughs> with the image overlay um, uh, on the left uh, parapharyngeal space. So um, just to move it a little bit along here, if you'll see, um, you'll see here there's an orange bit behind this overlay here, which is the actual internal carotid artery. And you can see the overlay actually matches where the um, internal carotid artery uh, is located very, very nicely. Um, there are certain problems uh, with our overlay. Um, it doesn't give you a great depth perception, um, and it can also lead to some inattention blindness. So you can maybe so focused on the overlay that you miss some other things um, that are uh, outside that field of view. Um, so there can be some complications for that, but there may be some role um, in searching with these Tau Pro images uh, if we develop this a little further uh, for overlaying augmented reality for some neurovascular structures that could be useful uh, for surgery, uh, be it for more precise surgery uh, and more safe surgery in the future. Um, and moving on to kind of real-time interoperative guidance uh, with image systems. This is some more research realm work. Um, what we've done and thought of is actually using uh, real-time uh, MRI uh, with uh, robot controls that are outside the MRI suite to control robot system that is under uh, within the MRI coil itself uh, to do surgical resections. Um, and what you see here on the left-hand side is a, a cadaver head uh, fixated in a coil and there's a dental guard placed in the mouth. Um, and the controls are outside in the control room. Um, and you can actuate um, and use a laser, for example, to do laser ablation of tissue. Um, and you can also monitor the temperature real time. Uh, I give you an idea of the depth of resection, uh, depth of ablation of the tissue. And you can also possibly do preoperative surgical planning of uh, how much you would want to ablate or resect uh, with the laser. Um, and this is what we did with uh, ex vivo tissue. So this was uh, pig's tongue. Um, and we did this in an MRI coil 
Um, and you can see before ablation and after ablation, you can actually see in very, very fine detail with these real-time MRIs uh, of the ablation with uh, laser. Um, and then we actually, we tried this on a cadaver head. Um, so we fixated a cadaver head to a mount. We placed the um, hydraulic actuators, uh, motors, because uh, we kind of have metal parts within the MRI suite. Um, and we uh, hooked this up to the MRI coil. Um, and with uh, real-time MRI, uh, and also with, uh, this was a more research, but we pre-planned resection uh, over this area of the soft palate. Uh, we were able to uh, basically follow this pre-planned area, ablate the soft palate, while monitoring the uh, temperature uh, real time as well to give us an idea of the depth uh, that we had ablated to uh, underneath the MRI guidance. Um, so this is a little bit more um, uh, blue sky research, um, but the idea is that we're working towards uh, real time image guidance uh, that will help us in the in the future of photo automation, which will definitely need some sort of image guidance to help us in our surgical resections if that is where we end up. And the other thing is also flexible scope image guidance. So uh, transitioning, for example, from a DaVinci XI to the SP, there has been some increase uh, in terms of flexibility of the robotic, robotic system. Uh, Med Robotics is somewhat similar in terms of the camera being more flexible. Um, and we have thought about uh, using uh, augmented reality uh, uh, with a flexible scope um, and how we would do this to also improve the workflow of registration uh, process uh, in terms of uh, image registration um, uh, that we can be more streamlined. For example, now if you uh, do a uh, sinus surgery, you register the patient's anatomy to the uh, imaging uh, during the time of surgery, sometimes it can be a bit of a hassle. And we wanted to try and improve that process before surgery. Um, so obtain a preoperative image of the patient. Uh, and this is the hard part, doing the 3D segmentation of the imaging data, which is a lot of um, uh, manual input. Uh, this is not automated yet and does take a lot of time uh, from our, our before actually getting to uh, the patient. Uh, hopefully this can be streamlined uh, in the future. Uh, and we designed a dental guard, uh, which could be 3D printed uh, and with biocompatible material um, and calibrated it uh, prior to uh, using on the cadaver. Uh, and when we put the slap the dental guard on the patient, then you're ready to go with uh, the image registration. Um, obviously, there's some challenges with doing this. Uh, we depend on partly the bony anatomy, the teeth anatomy. Uh, there can be artifacts from the imaging, uh, from the CT imaging or the MRI imaging because of dental implants. Um, but we are able to get around some of that with just using one tooth um, and uh, anchoring the uh, EM tracker as well uh, to one part of a tooth or over the alveolus as well. Um, and we we tried, this is some really prelim work, um, we basically implanted targets uh, onto the cadaver skull. We tried originally with an original target here, um, just cutting down onto the skull on the bone and using some tissue adhesive to stick it on. It didn't work quite well. So next we took some drill bits, we drilled into the skull and then screw these plastic screws in. Um, that was uh, that was much better, um, but we had, we broke the drill bit uh, while doing it. Um, so we had some challenges with that, but we were able to scan these um, heads uh, in the CT uh, with these particular targets, uh, which are color contrasted with the head, and they had these small indentations as well for uh, the tracking probe uh, sampling. Um, and we would we placed the EM tracker at the end of a flexible scope. So we use our, uh, the scopes that we use all the time in clinic. We placed the EM tracker at the end of the steerable <laughs> bending bit. Um, and we had to calibrate this with using our hand and eye to calibrate by looking at these targets um, uh, and create a you know, the virtual image. Uh, the challenges with it were the missing teeth in the cadaver uh, and some of the metal crowns. Um, but hopefully in this video you can see here, we created an overlay um, by segmenting out um, some um, sinuses, the frontal sinus and maxillary sinus. But you can also, no also notice that you have to play around with the transparency to give you that sort of depth perception. Uh, that's something that we're tinkering with. We haven't really uh, done very well in, in, in creating a better depth perception uh, of where these sinuses are with doing these augmented images. Um, and um, using the flexible tip uh, and the scope uh, with the EM tracker, uh, we were able to uh, pretty accurately um, identify uh, the location. It matched pretty well, nicely. Uh, with the CT images, uh, with what we saw on the flexible scope. 
Um, so some of the uses, uh, some of the things we're going to do um, would be to uh, um, look at the uh, pre order planning for resection margins, improve depth perception, and possibly labeling for trading education. Um, and the registration error for uh, our system was actually pretty good. 1.9 millimeter is, is better than what is in the literature. Uh, and the mean of projection error is 2.59. That's something new that we calculated. And you can see here it's based on how far our virtual target was off from the real target. And when we project, when we looked through the camera uh, and this augmented reality view. Um, and we, the potential sources of error for, from the experiment with the dental guard, with the um, possible the debris, possible the CT quality, possible with the dental artifacts and the initial uh, hand eye collaboration. Um, but the idea is that we want to kind of develop this a little bit more so that we have some sort of image guidance or augmented system for flexible robotic systems that something that we believe is, is, is coming along and they will see more and more going into the future. The other end of the spectrum that you'll see coming across will be something that is lower, lower cost. Um, I mean, using the DaVinci intuitive system uh, is very, very expensive. Um, and this is what my, my boss initially started. This is before I came back um, working on assistive surgical robots. Uh, this is particularly for endoscopic uh, robotic surgery uh, for the sinus. And the idea is a, if you want to put it, a glorif um, modified uh, camera holder uh, that has a robotic assistive function. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, the first prototype uh, is very, very clunky. Um, it moves very, very quickly as well once you see it move. Uh, the second prototype was much more streamlined. So this is the first prototype. Um, this is before I joined uh, CUHK here. Um, and it has a good range of movement, um, but it's a very uh, large profile and it moves very, very quickly. Um, and I think if it hit tissue, uh, there was no safety function to kind of stop it moving uh, and, and going through uh, uh, tissues, uh, be it were. So um, did, did some cadaver trials on that, and we moved to a second iteration. And these are foot controlled uh, uh, robotic arms with uh, the feet uh, angulation and movement of the ankle through a Bluetooth device controlling the movement of certain joints uh, of this endoscope photo. Um, and uh, this was um, a lot of discussion, uh, I guess, between uh, my boss and the, and the engineers, um, and they would come back with iterations uh, a few months later. Um, and but there was a lot of change in terms of the PhD students that were going through this particular system. So there was not really one particular person that was a stakeholder uh, for this particular uh, robot. Um, and so you'd have people people coming along who were not privy to the previous discussions possibly um, and developing this robot down the line. So this is the most recent iteration of this foot controlled robot. Um, <clears throat> and there was these passive joints which were not. Uh, gravity compensated uh, if the system was not plugged in. And still had a range of movements uh, in certain areas. And uh, it was still foot controlled. And we took this to the um, do some cladaver works as well, uh, again, um, to try and see uh, if we could train one the surgeon to use this particular system in preparation for possibly using this uh, on a, a real life patient and see if it would actually improve uh, surgery, uh, improve the efficiency of our surgery, um, and, and help with that. Um, you can use two hands with the surgery, um, but the movement of the camera is, is relatively slow. Um, and to take it out of the holder is not exactly uh, quick and easy at this time point. But we did take it to uh, try it out on, on one particular patient, a simple, uh, just a mini fez uh, patient, but. The surgery itself took a long time. Um, there was no lens cleaning function that was able to accommodate with docking of this robotic system. So uh, we told the engineers, um, this was about, I think about two or three years ago, um, what the problems were with the system and what we would like to see before we tried anything again. And um, we haven't seen any uh, updates at this point in time. Um, and this is a couple of years uh, that would lead us to um, keep on using the system and trying out again. Uh, in real life patients. Um, so I think what I wanted to highlight here is, is it's a lot of work and discussion between engineers uh, and clinicians and to keep it moving along and motivated, but you do have to have some stakeholders uh, in moving these systems uh, from preclinical to clinical and ideally eventually to commercialization.
Um, and just briefly, uh, what we've started to look at uh, as well is something called endo endoscopic, somebody calls a dissection, something that's very popular uh, in uh, Asia uh, for removing early cancer lesions in the upper aerodigestive tract or uh, even in the colorectal region. Um, and a modification of this would be ELPS uh, for hypopharyngeal lesions as well. And we're trying to robotize uh, this particular system, but um, I won't go into that further discussion. Uh, but it's something that we. So the other thing would be new tools. Um, and this I really like is, is a bone drill that is robotized. Uh, right now, I think it's down to 4.5 millimeters. Uh, and um, you can go up to about 10,000 RPM. And this is drilling a, a, I think it's a uh, sheep's femur, if I'm correct. Um, uh, but it works very, very nicely. And we're trying to get this as an, actually a, a handheld device that can be angulated uh, initially before even getting it to use in a robot. Um, so these, uh, this is an exciting instrument that I think will work uh, and hopefully can be used and applied clinically uh, in the near future. And the other thing is, uh, we always have trouble uh, with the Asian population more so, I think, in terms of exposure to work in the larynx and hy uh, hypopharynx. Uh, and this is a tool called the Sato 2 retractor that you see here. It has a very, very curved blade and it's held in a, uh, um, a retractor. Uh, and it really does lift up the uh, larynx and hypopharynx very, very nicely. Uh, we tried using this with the DaVinci SB system to see if we could do more work in the larynx and hypopharynx. Uh, there are some limitations. Some of the uh, the dials um, hit the actual um, docking part uh, of the single port system here, so it has limitations of how far you can push it in. Um, but we were able to show that uh, with the Sato 2 retractor, you do get a better exposure, even in a real, the second cadaver was really tough. You get a greater exposure uh, with this type of retractor better than the FKWO and obviously better than the Crow Davis. So working with neural tools uh, may help us facilitate uh, whatever tools we have right now to do better surgery uh, and do different types uh, of surgery for our patients. And that moves on to clinical trials um, uh, that uh, we've been involved in here. And I think um, the most um, notable one would be related to the um, DaVinci SB system. So uh, this is slides courtesy of Chris Holzinger. Um, so First generation robotic systems, uh, DaVinci S, DaVinci SI, uh, which I had the opportunity to use uh, both here in Hong Kong and while at Hopkins were not bad for transoral endoscopic surgery, uh, but the instruments were really designed for uh, general surgery. Um, and they were rigid uh, and the size were not really appropriate for uh, procedures that we would do transorally when we had no customized instrumentations. Um, and this is the SP, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, that uh, was designed actually, I think it was first uh, used in 2009 uh, in a clinical trial for prostatectomies uh, in France. Uh, and subsequently, we did the ENT clinical trial back in 2016 or end of 2016 uh, for this uh, Da Vinci SP robot. Uh, Raymond Zung and, and Chris did the, some of the preclinical work uh, in cadavers. Here, they looked at using it for nasal pharyngectomy. I can tell you, working through the palate to look at the nasal pharynx is not like this uh, in a real life human. Uh, it's much more edematous tissue and very, very difficult to see the coenor uh, without splitting the path they show here. Um, and this was going back um, to talk more about the kind of logistics uh, and the experience of uh, doing this clinical trial with a system. I mean, this was new to us at that point, uh, 2.5 centimeter cannula. Uh, this uh, SP system here, you had to deploy the arms at least 10 to 15 centimeters out of the cannula before you could use it to maximize the elbows. And these were six millimeter flexible instruments. You could use three instrument arms uh, in addition to a camera, which was oval shaped, uh, 1.2 uh, centimeters in size. And the workspace was about the size of a tennis ball. That was the case, the, the instrumentation that was available included uh, the monopolar scissors for cautery spatula tip, uh, fenestrated bipolar, Maryland bipolar, uh, which we used. We didn't really use a clip applier or needle driver during uh, our particular uh, clinical trial. Um, so the, the kind of developing and working up towards this clinical trial um, here in Hong Kong, I think ethics application approval is an easier process. Uh, we don't have an equivalent of an FDA for device uh, approval to be uh, used uh, as well. Um, so it's made much more based on an institution in terms of getting ethics application, application and approval for use. Um, then we obviously have to discuss with the facilities in terms of floor loading 
uh, for the DaVinci SP and also the um, sterilization uh, of these different arms, uh, make sure they were trained to do this at our facility. Um, and then was the training for the surgeons. So uh, this involved multiple uh, surgeons, not just our specialty, but other specialties as well. So we had to spend, um, I think, two days, uh, four days in total uh, at Sunnyvale uh, doing training on the system, uh, two separate times, one closer to when we were starting the clinical trial. And traveling to Sunnyvale takes about 15 hours by flight already. So it's about a four or five day round trip uh, to do that. Uh, the nurses had training on site in Hong Kong. And prior to actually starting the trial, we had dry ones uh, in the hospital, in the operating rooms with the anesthetists uh, before starting these procedures to make sure everyone was familiar uh, with the setup, uh, which is really not that different from uh, TOR's uh, surgery. Uh, so it was not difficult to do these particular uh, dry runs. But the draping was a lot different uh, than that for the Da Vinci uh, SI, which we had at that time. Um, and so the operating room setup, we're lucky. Uh, we had a pretty big operating room that we could use for the setup, and uh, this was a, a luxury that we have. It's not available uh, everywhere. Um, and this is a panoramic view, so you could see the surgeon console uh, in the corner of the room. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, vis the patient cart here, uh, the vision cart down here, the surgeons were sitting off to the side of the patient, uh, helping with suctioning and some sort of retraction, and the back table uh, off to one side. And this is kind of a schematic view uh, of uh, how this was. And as, as you all know now, probably the patient cart pushing in is, is, is really easy. Uh, but the patient head does have to be almost all the way down because um, pushing the patient cart in, uh, the height of the, the boom is only so high. Uh, and they have a quite, the single port is actually quite long in itself. Uh, and we published this uh, over the last few years. Uh, with the team uh, from Hong Kong, Eddie, uh, who's my close colleague, uh, Raymond Zhang from the University of Hong Kong, and, and Chris, who also came here um, at the beginning of the trial as well to uh, help with uh, things running smoothly. Um, um, and uh, this was essentially a phase one clinical trial uh, looking at multi specialty, so colorectal and urology as well, which ran from December 2016 to October 2017. And the primary endpoints were mainly conversion rates, which we no, no patient was converted to the old robotic system, and perioperative complications within 30 days. And secondary endpoints included operative time, blood loss, and pain scores. Um, and this is kind of the multi-specialty that was involved in this trial. We had 21 cases. Most of them were oral pharynx. Uh, we did have some uh, nasal pharynx. Unfortunately, there was no uh, good nasal pharyngectomy case during that time point. Uh, and some work in the larynx and hyperpharynx. Uh, colorectal mainly was on TAMIS uh, and hemicolectomies, but they did do TATMEs, transanal work as well. Uh, and urology did just radical prostatectomies uh, for their particular um, uh, trial. Um, and exposure, we found uh, we use mostly Crow Davis. The FK uh, didn't work quite well in our population, partly probably because of Southern Asian um, uh, craniofacial uh, setup is, is different from in Caucasians. Um, and in terms of the clinical cases here, most of them were Chinese. Uh, we did have one Caucasian, one Indian, um, and majority were in the oral pharynx. Um, and uh, we really did not have any complications that required a return to the operating room to be treated. Um, they all could be managed. There was some minimal bleeding that was managed at the bedside. Um, so no major, major complications. Uh, and here, looking at the pathology of the cases, um, so in the oral pharynx, um, we did have six HPV positive cases. Most of those were tonsil. There was one HPV negative SCC, which was kind of a typical Hong Kong case, which is a post-RT nasopharynx lady, uh, developed second primary SCC at the tongue base that they were able to resect uh, with the robot. She did require a tracheostomy for uh, coverage um, and uh, did have this for a slightly long time, was eventually decannulated. Uh, she was on a feeding tube for a long time, but eventually, again, the feeding tube was removed, but it took a long time because of a prior irradiation history. Um, and uh, around a similar time, slightly later, the, they also started the trial um, in the U.S., uh, UPenn uh, with Weinstein, O'Malley, uh, celebration with Magnuson and Stanford Holzinger, looking at T1, T2 uh, oral pharyngeal lesions uh, as well. And we uh, publicized, uh, published uh, uh, combined data looking just at the oral franks, um, and the surgical outcomes from these prospective non-randomized clinical trials. And essentially the uh, blood loss was uh, minimal and there was really uh, no transfusion required. Um, the perioperative tracheostomy 
uh, mainly uh, for one, I think it was a severe OSA patient, but the one in UPenn for ours was the MPC post RT patient um, and no long term tracheostomies. And um, presence of a nasal gastric tube at last visit, which for us was at 30 days, uh, was for our one lady post RT again. Um, and there was only one positive surgical margin, uh, and there were I think overall about a 5% bleed rate that re required a return to the operating room, which is within the normals. Um, so it was not higher than expected. Uh, subsequently, uh, the system was approved for TORS, again for orpharynx T1, T2, and urology for prostatectomy. And, and what we learned from this, these cases was that uh, the system was obviously very easy to dock. Uh, we could use actual three instrument arms with the camera uh, to operate. Um, but you didn't have to always use three instrument arms. You could use two uh, and play around with what was best uh, for yourself. The bipolar energy was uh, useful. Uh, and obviously, we only did 21 cases, so we were still in the learning curve. And despite this advanced robotic system, uh, exposure was still critical uh, to us getting to uh, particular locations, uh, tongue base, uh, larynx, and hypopharynx, do what we wanted to do. So we were still limited somewhat by exposure. Um, and uh, areas we thought that could be developed and improved and, and talking to the engineers. Uh, so, for example, we're non-stick cautery. Um, and I guess this is what we mean is really minimizing the char to our cautery. Uh, focus energy delivery devices. So, for example, a needle point or a laser like they used to have for the laser holder with the SI system. Uh, possibility of bone drilling instruments. There are variations in workspace. Uh, that would allow us to do or reach different areas um, by variations in the cannula. Um, and I'll show you some pictures. The reflection of the sheath uh, from uh, the trial version uh, of the arms uh, was quite reflective um, and it bothered um, a number of surgeons. So the sheaths that are available commercially now are actually different, they're darker. Um, and we also talked about further camera angulation. So despite the kind of um, you know, uh, angulation of the camera, it still was only about a 30 degree camera angle. Also, we talked about the uh, possibility of further camera angulation to, uh, for hard to reach areas and development of improved retractors uh, to aid in further exposure or uh, improve exposure for uh, development of surgical resections. <clears throat> so what we did uh, after moving beyond the initial trials, it was not just the clinical trial, then we stopped. Um, we looked at further improvements in the, in the actual Da Vinci SP system. Um, and this is uh, on the left here is uh, a picture of Ichiro Tatea and uh, Prosco from Korea, Ichiro is from Japan, working on hypopharyngeal resections. And what they did here is they actually filed down a spatula tip to a needle tip cautery, uh, working on a cadaver uh, to do a um, hypopharyngeal resection um, because the spatula tip is not focused energy enough and there was too much charring of the tissue in this region. So they decided to file it down and try it. Unfortunately, there's no needle tip cautery available uh, in the repertoire of um, instrument arms uh, with DaVinci SP at this point. Um, so that is a work in progress. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some more focus energy device to work on the larynx and the hypopharynx. Um, and next, in the trials, we did encounter broken sheaths uh, as well. Um, and we actually encountered this, this actually um, in the lab as well while we were training. And, uh, what this led to um, when the broken sheath, there was actually a conduction of current between uh, the instruments here and the mucosa, which causes burn inside the mouth. And subsequently, they had to develop a system that would um, basically cause a circuit breaker uh, to stop um, using the or detect the break in the sheath um, because of the current leak um, before we actually ran the clinical trial. Um, so that was something new that was developed after us using um, doing some cadaver work. And they also developed some tata sheaths um, because this can uh, break easily uh, by rubbing against the teeth potentially. And changing the sheath can be a little bit more time consuming for us in patient surgeons. Uh, and this is the reflection of the sheath that I mentioned. You can see uh, the bright light reflecting off the sheath here, uh, which is distracting for some of the surgeons that participated in the trial. Um, and it resulted in these um, darker sheaths um, that tore less easily. Uh, and also had less reflection, which are uh, the ones currently in use. So this was done. Um, and subsequently, uh, I've also been involved in, in training prior to COVID-19 for uh, using the DaVinci SP system, um, and a, uh, along with one of uh, our close friends, Ryan, who, who uh, uh, good friends with Jamie as well. Uh, so this is some of the courtesy uh, from him as well. 
Um, and if you've worked with the SP system, you can uh, the, we, the and you've done the training, the, we talk about a cobra up, cobra down uh, position for the camera arm. And this is basically the arm here curved down where this is a cobra down or cobra below position of the camera arm. And the idea of this is to create the workspace. Um, if you don't create the workspace, then you run into trouble with the instrument arms probably running over the top uh, of the camera. Um, and you will see the arms slip as they move. Um, and it was when you're training the surgeons, um, it found some surgeons have found it more difficult uh, to one toggle into uh, this particular um, camera adjust mode um, and subsequently move your arm from this position to this position on the left here, on the right here, sorry, uh, to get into that cobra below position. And similarly, to get into Cobra above position, uh, to toggle into the camera adjust mode, and then looking from above down below. Uh, and we noticed some of these difficulties um, during the training of surgeons. Uh, and I know um, Ryan was um, was uh, writing this up the, uh, and using this to to help train surgeons. And the other thing is um, now with the instrument arms, you, you can't because they're not rigid and they have an elbow. Sometimes the elbows are out of your field of view. Uh, you can use this central toggle to get an idea of um, where that instrument arms are in space. Uh, it gives you a rough idea so that you know uh, how far away are they going to be bumping into anything? Are they going to be rubbing against your camera? Are they going to be rubbing against your instrument arms? But conceptually, it's a little different uh, to perceive how these instrument arms are oriented to 3D space. Um, sometimes I actually have to leave the chair and go and look at the bedside to get an idea uh, of how best to adjust um, the instrument arms into a position that would facilitate uh, doing the surgical procedure because uh, it's much more hard to to uh, perceive uh, the three-dimensional um, orientation of the instrument arms and cameras sometimes. Um, and besides just doing uh, working on these training procedures, we also worked on developing further uh, potential procedures. Um, and uh, one of the ones we, we looked into was using uh, doing transoral thyroidectomy uh, with the SP system. So what we did uh, actually is we took a wound protector. Uh, we made a roughly about a 2.5 centimeter central incision uh, in the um, uh, gingival labial sulcus uh, over the uh, mandibular alveolus region. Uh, we did initially do a dissection using an endoscope first to raise the tissue plane. Uh, and then we placed the wound protector in, and then we we taped uh, or we tied the wound protector uh, to the single port. We placed um, three instrument arms uh, in through uh, this um, wound protector here, and then the camera. Uh, it was very very difficult to do, even with um, the uh, actual uh, cadaver. So I imagine it would be much more difficult uh, in a uh, real life patient to do. Uh, but we were able to do a transoral uh, thyroidectomy resection uh, with insufflation, uh, gas insufflation, using the SP system. Uh, subsequently, obviously, Professor Ko uh, in Yonsei has done, um, uh, basically, he designed his own retractor uh, to do transoral uh, resection uh, with the SP robot using, uh, basically, his retractor without insufflation. And I think he's done something like 80 cases now uh, in, in, in Korea. So it's feasible to use uh, da Vinci SP system. Uh, I would say it's not easy. Um, we were exploring uh, different areas uh, potentially that we could use uh, the robot uh, to work on. Um, and uh, the other, this is working with uh, Megan Taylor UGA, um, looking at uh, lateral intravenous hypophosa. Uh, she published a nice article uh, using this for uh, using um, the SI system. I think it was for uh, ju uh, juvenile angiofibromas. Um, and we basically we had to do this bony work initially all with uh, Ron Jor's uh, bone cutters uh, to get create this initial space uh, and then we would retract uh, and we would use the SP system to dissect uh, the infratemporal fossa and you can see um, the fossa valley here with the VCQ fibers transected lateral pterygoid plate um, pterygoid muscle um, the startup process here uh, and the spine uh, of the sphenoid here um, just to explore if we could use this uh, in the infratemporal fossa. I think uh, it was a little tough, particularly without the bony instrumentation. Um, uh, so it's still, I'm not sure if we can use this clinically. We'll have to see what um, Megan does. We tried it using this method uh, with the NP as well, going through uh, the maxilla uh, 
Um, and again, it was a tough because of the bony limitations and bony uh, landmark, uh, bony structures that were um, restricting us in getting to where we wanted to go. Uh, and finally, um, just to look at other available robotic systems. So I think that the uh, robotic market uh, has been really um, heated up and, and changing very, very quickly. Um, for example, the ION system for bronchoscopy uh, with Intuitive. Uh, Aorus was bought by JJ, which is another endoscopic bronchoscopic system. Uh, we have Medrobotics that's commercially available as well uh, in our ENT field and colorectal. Um, Versius, which is done by Cambridge Medical Robotics, um, is in the laparoscopic market. Um, and um, I guess Metronic has bought out Transenterics, uh, working with Titan, who is a single port medical as well. So there are a lot of robotic systems uh, in the uh, market right now that we will see more and more of. Um, and we've been actually talking with um, Versius, and this is Cambridge Medical Robotics, um, and actually got to try it out just today. So I just added this picture today. Um, theirs is an interesting system. Um, so these are, this is the camera arm here. These are two instrument arms here. Uh, and the footprint is much smaller than the intuitive system. Uh, and these modules are much lighter. There's no issue with floor loading per se. Uh, and they have a zero degree, 30 degree scope. They have monopolar spatula, bipolar Maryland's, uh, and the instrument arms are six millimeters. Um, and this is the console here. Um, it's almost like playing with a Xbox in some ways uh, with the controllers a little bit. Um, and it's fairly easy to use. Uh, if you obviously use the Intuita Da Vinci system, I think this would be adequate uh, and easy to pick up. Uh, it's also a 3D view. It's not uh, not a surgeon console immersion view. Uh, they're using, a, I guess, a Sony, con uh, Sony console here, uh, and you wear 3D glasses to see it in three dimension. Um, and these, for this, um, if we were to do it in our field, we wouldn't have necessarily a troll car. Uh, these, uh, the Versius robot, actually you, you train them to work, you create the remote center for this particular system. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's really easy to move around. Uh, and for me, the, the, th the thought would be, I don't need a dedicated robot room to, to use this particular system, so I'm not limi lim uh, limited uh, by a robotic room availability, um, and I can possibly ask to use this robot uh, in one case in the middle of the day if it fits. Uh, and move it around within the surgical OR. So this is a really um, kind of nimble system. Uh, and obviously, I think uh, the talking to the cells, the, the pricing is very, very different um, from from that of intuitive and, and the model of pricing is very, very different. So I think we'll be seeing um, more of these robots even in our space that can be used and will be trialed um, um, and much more competition, which I think will be good uh, for the robot robotics area uh, within our specialty. Um, and finally, I think uh, moving forward, some of the grand challenges in developing these science robotics will be revolving around materials. Uh, material sciences here, um, kind of bio-inspired uh, robots uh, based on um, body systems or the environment uh, or in nature itself, um, with, you know, kind of miniaturizing of the systems, moving from uh, large profile to small profile flexible systems and even and nanorobots, uh, our swarm robots uh, that people are publishing more and more about. Um, and um, kind of with that, I'd like to uh, thank my team here at UHK, uh, Eddie Wong, Lex, uh, Xenon Eric, the Hong Kong U Engineering team, Chris and Stanford, uh, Intuitive, and uh, some of the support I received from the Stanley Ho Medical Foundation here. So thank you. <laughs>